All right, welcome everyone. My name is Eric Nathan. I'm composer in residence of the New England Philharmonic. Hi, I'm Danny Madden. I'm the concertmaster of the New England Philharmonic. Uh, welcome to listening in a deep dive into the music with the NEP. It's a series where we speak to composers and performers about their art and work. Um, it's also to help our audiences hear this music and, and taking a step behind the scenes to see how it's made, what's inspired it, how performances of it have come together. And uh, this season we've been featuring composers and performers who are being performed or programmed this season or playing with us. And um, you can see archived videos on our website and YouTube page for other um, interviews. Um, today our guest is Dr. Chen Yi, and uh, you can stay tuned for the final um, interview later this uh, season with Igor Santos. So um, Chen Yi has been the Lorena Cravens Millsap Missouri Distinguished Professor at the Conservatory of Music and Dance at the University of Missouri, Kansas City since 1998 and she's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Letters and recipient of many commissions and awards in the field including some of the top awards such as the Charles Ives Living Award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Um, her works have been premiered and performed by numerous uh, leading ensembles, including the New York Philharmonic, and recently in the recent seasons by the Seattle Symphony, the Grossman Ensemble, Guangzhou Symphony, Leipzig Radio Symphony, among, among many others. And so we're really honored to welcome Chen Yi here. So welcome, Dr. Chen. Oh, sorry, we're uh, muted here. Thank you. Oh, I think you're muted. Can you unmute yourself? Sorry. Uh -huh. There we go. Hi. Thank you, Eric, for inviting me to meet uh, all of our audience, as well as to meet our wonderful concert master, uh, Denny. Uh, great to see you all, because uh, we could take this opportunity to introduce our piece uh, to uh, more of our audience. Uh, we really look forward to this great performance, particularly um, I look forward to this uh, uh, reopening. Uh, concert and thank you, Eric, for inviting me. No, oh, it's really our pleasure to to have you here with us. Um, I had a question to start us off. I was curious, and I think some of our viewers may be as well. What first um, got you interested in being a composer? When did you first know um, you wanted to be a composer? Ah, and this is a good question because I am a violinist. I, I, I learned piano first when I was three. And then I started learning the violin when I was four. Uh, my parents uh, both are medical doctors, but they love classical music. So it, at our home, we have, have a huge collections of um, uh, long play records uh, for all this uh, classical repertoire. And so I grew up with uh, this. I, I thought that I have a plane through all the standard concertos uh, on the violin. <laughs> like uh, when you mentioned all this uh, Bach, Beethoven, um, uh, Brahms, <laughs> Tchaikovsky, <laughs> and all of this. And then I uh, also went on to uh, 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 Guangzhou Peking Opera Orchestra because during the Cultural Revolution, I was sent to countryside to work as um, a farmer um, mm -hmm. for two years to be re-educated. Um, at that time, classical music was prohibited completely, and as well as folk music prohibited because it would be con considered a kind of a pollution. And at this time, I still carry my little violin with me because I thought that the violin is not a huge instrument. It could sleep at the corner of my bed still. I just took a little area. And, and then I could play the only allowed songs, which are the revolutionary songs. And, and those melodies are being recognized by everybody. So when I play through these melodies, no more, nobody would stop me. Uh, in spare time after hard working. Usually the hard working day, you grow all kinds of vegetables and rice, sometimes being sent to military um, um, to build a castle, like, like, like a watchtower on top of the mountains. 
hard labor work. And, and still the spare time I would play all these melodies with Paganini <laughs> techniques. <Wow. laughs> and, and then I still could keep my fingers moving. I thought that it was my first composition. When you ask me <laughs> what brings me to composition, I thought that I didn't right realize that the improvisation became the first <laughs> composition lesson. And, and but later, and I remember that my dad um, um, told us that I have a, all three siblings, all learn um, uh, instruments. My dad told me, oh, it would be great if one day my daughter could compose like a Hyphus and like a Chrysler Menuhin. You see, all these great violinists would compose for themselves and, and they lasted long. And uh, one day I would expect my daughter could do that too. And, and so he invited uh, a theory teacher who taught me uh, harmonies, like a strict two books in um, uh, tonal and also um, like a diatonic and, and then chromatic harmonies before I went to conservatory. And, but not until I was 25 years old, the uh, whole university system was not open until 1978. When I was already 25, I told my students, hey, it's the time. You guys won the DMA already. <laughs> now is my freshman. <laughs> so don't compare with the works that I wrote in my freshman year because I was old enough. <laughs> After eight years of serving as a concert master in the Peking Opera Orchestra in Guangzhou, my home city, because I was lucky enough to be brought back to the city after two years of labor work, all of my classmates stay in the countryside for about five years, uh, being a farmer. Mm. What was your experience as concertmaster of the Beijing Opera Troupe in your ah. home? What, what were some of your duties? And you see what, uh, because you are chosen to serve in such a opera orchestra, which promotes revolutionary sample operas. And so you are allowed to practice the Western repertoire <laughs> because this is kind of a surface. You need to improve the skill in order to play better in the orchestra. So, so when I, I, my work in the orchestra, um, not only to write all the fingering, bowing, all this, that could train me well. <laughs> I also help other instrumentalists because this 35 people orchestra would also have about 10 people who play Chinese traditional instruments besides the Western part. And, and they read um, not the Western notation. Usually when they got training, they read the Chinese notation, sometimes like a one, two, three, four, five, Arabic numbers, right? And, we have to copy our own parts for each show. So I would help them because when I read a Western notation and read the Chinese notation, it's no different for me. So I could do it easily. So I was helping many <laughs> colleagues to um, copy their parts as well. In spare time when they practice, I would help them to adjust their scales, for example, the French horn, uh, he would play um, the whole scale for me. Uh, I would uh, uh, adjust it, like a, this picture is not right, and uh, uh, slightly is flat and something like that. I would help everybody in the brass section, also the woodwind section. And then uh, that's why I also learned a lot of fingerings of the Chinese traditional instruments. Um, when we have um, a rehearsal every morning, um, yesterday, uh, you may have to go to uh, like a reading, uh, like a mm, to study like a political uh, uh, journals, <laughs> articles. And in the evening, you have concert, right? It's a 10x, like a 10 uh, uh, x big, um, big opera for revolutionary sample operas. Uh, you have to stay in theater for three hours at night. And, and after that, you are not ended yet. You have to go to a dinner. Like the dinner was after the, the show and you have to criticize <laughs> what you have done tonight. <laughs> um, and by then I would name 
uh, each wrong part, <laughs> I would have to say, oh, we have to improve uh, this part, the entrance not line up and or your intonation not good at kind of uh, spots. And all this uh, uh, criticism uh, would be helpful for the next uh, improvement. And then you went to rehearsal the next day. And so such and such, and those uh, operas uh, that they play are in very good quality. Um, yeah. So in essence, you were like a conductor and you were critiquing the other players. Was it, it was you who's giving the critique at the end? We do. Yeah, we do have the conductor who is an excellent cellist, uh, who later studied in Belgium and also a master degree from Central Conservatory of Music. Um, and he would do uh, much more because uh, he is the one who have to point out all these mistakes. That so some musicians would have to hate him because they said that you point out in public or oh, sometimes it's rude. And, and I thought that it is a hard job for him to do uh, besides his own playing. And, but during these eight years, he only served as a conductor. He didn't have to play his own instrument. And so uh, although he still keeps practicing, he now lives in Canada. Canada, uh, still plays uh, in public concerts. I thought that uh, during that time, I learned a lot of uh, Chinese uh, things because uh, um, the conductor re require every uh, Western instrumentalist to study how to play the Chinese instruments. For example, I play violin. I have to know what's going on on the fiddle. The picking up the fiddle, you see how screamingly high, right? Always. You do that <laughs> very loud. <laughs> and, and, but these masters, they are very humble. They teach you. And they said, uh, uh, quiet, quiet. Uh, let me pray for you. And uh, look at my fingering. <laughs> look at my bowing. Like this is um, uh, different from yours. And from which I learned a lot because Dini asked me what I have learned. I have learned all of their fingering and bowing. <laughs> we started from second position, fourth position, sixth position, which is different from classical repertoire. And now you can deal with all this very hard, uh, like um, uh, switching. Uh, or moderations easily because uh, they use uh, different positions like uh, what we learned from Carfresh scale, <laughs> which was start in different position. I thought that it is very helpful for me. And I use their fingering to compose as well. When you listen to my music, you always think, oh, this is something uh, Chinese. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And for example, uh, 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 you use the uh, bowing. <laughs> Everything is the accent with a dumb bow. And, and it's a very special uh, bowing, uh, which we don't use normally. But when you learn that, you smile to it <laughs> because it's so easy and so authentic. It's some, something Chinese, actually. Uh, yeah, so those are the things I, I would say that I learned a lot from that eight years of uh, uh, service. Wow, that's that's wonderful. I mean, in in the piece that we're, we're presenting, Spring, Spring in Dresden, your violin concerto, um, some of those uh, traditional Chinese instrument fingerings you put right into the part and it's wonderful fun and a challenge, you know, to, to learn those beautiful sliding, almost vocal fingerings uh, that are not typical Western classical fingerings. And they make a, a sound that is, um, you know, keening or, or vocal or, uh, it, it's hard to describe, but I remember uh, I had a boyfriend once in Singapore when I played there. He played the air hu, and he was always sliding, and it was so facile and and beautiful. That's also in your spring in Dresden, and and it would be great if we could um, ask you some questions about your your gorgeous violin concerto and how it started as a chamber piece called Happy Rain. Yes, and because of Happy Rain on a spring night. Uh, I would say that 
um, uh, the quiet rain comes to the land at night. So uh, uh, secretly murmuring, like uh, uh, quietly coming in to do good things to mutual the land, the earth, without showing off. <laughs> and then when it comes to the second half of the piece, this comes to a flourishing uh, uh, flowers, uh, blossom that covers the town, or this uh, uh, climax uh, build up. And that would become the later of the piece. And that uh, completely follows the uh, structure of the poem, uh, which inspired me uh, to write the chamber piece, A Happy Rain on the Spring Night. Yeah, if uh, Eric could post the, the poem in Chinese and English, then we would see clearly, you see the English translation I did um, in order for you to understand the meaning uh, when I read the Chinese, because this is a poem written by Du Fu, um, one of the biggest poets in Tang Dynasty. And, and when I read this poem, and then you would also find some lines I would use in your solo part to imitate the, a kind of a reciting uh, style, uh, being our melody. Tao Yu That is the beginning. Uh, a good rain, happy rain, ah, uh, uh, in the spring night. Sui Fung Chen Ru Ye Run Wu Si Wu Sheng with the wind that comes quietly at night. Um, that mutual the land uh, quietly, no sound. And then a uh, next uh, sentence uh, would be interesting. Ye Jin Yuan Ju He Jiang Chuan Huo Du Ming. This sentence means uh, so quiet. You see, all this uh, single path was in dark. Only the little light in the bowl. You see, the candle light in the bowl is flashing. Uh, you can see that a little bit. That would reflect that quite of. Um, quietness because it's uh, in dark and nobody could see anything you only see a little dot the light in the bowl so that is also reflected to our music when you see these little harmonics whip, 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 like this and it's shining uh, but alone just refreshing and and then the last uh, uh, two lines would be xiao kan hong shi chu hua chong jing guan cheng, which means uh, um, now almost dawn. Uh, you can see uh, everything is wet um, everywhere in the town. You can see the flowers cover the whole town blossoming, and and that is um um pretty. A uh, flourishing scene uh, when we see this. I have uh, these uh, double meanings because when I wrote this uh, chamber piece, I would just mean that uh, to describe the, um, uh, uh, this kind of a scene, a uh, happy scene, and also uh, to predict that our future. And, and that is uh, promising. That is the happiness uh, when we want to see. And But when I was a commission, uh, by uh, um, Mira, you see, you may know Mira because she is a BU alumna, and and she uh, invited me to write her a concerto commissioned by a friends of um, uh, uh, Dresden, and uh, along with uh, New York Philharmonic uh, with uh, Saxon State Orchestra. You know why? Because it was the year when. Uh, uh, the ladies' church was uh, reopened in Dresden. After the World War II, it was bombed. Uh, even the church was bombed uh, after the surrender. And, and still, uh, when it was rebuilt, the Queen, uh, Queen Elizabeth, she donated uh, the 300 pounds of a golden cloth and fit on top of the church. That was the um, reopen in October. Uh, so I wrote a piece to this event. Um, and so uh, I thought that is very meaningful. And also uh, very, uh, how do I say, important for us to build uh, the future 
uh, the peace of the future around the war. And we would see the nurturing force and we will look forward to the future of our better life in the war. And so I took this poem and, but the um, uh, solo part is uh, different because the your solo part is on top of this uh, chamber work. And uh, in the chamber work, you can see there is um, a golden section I built up. Uh, the golden section so-called uh, is uh, concerned with uh, the structure of the, uh, the music because the music is uh, uh, the art of times, right? You have to go through timing, like uh, um, uh, durations. And so I would use uh, the duration to measure the length um, when I count on these uh, uh, golden sections, because uh, there would be uh, the first golden section that would be the major climax, which would be uh, the peak of the whole piece when you uh, got into the whole orchestra duty um, uh, to this uh, flourishing film scene. And then there are secondary golden sections uh, in um, those uh, smaller chapters. And then you can see every time you have uh, changing of uh, groupings of uh, instruments, which means uh, orchestration textures. And you could go through this, and, but the um, solo part would have a free major cadenzas. Uh, you lead the whole orchestra in by playing a cadenza in the beginning to feature all uh, major materials, the motific materials. And then you would have a bigger cadenza in the middle uh, to develop all these materials just to show off the um, solo instrument. I really want you to do that because you already mentioned those uh, textures and fingerings that you already uh, understood everything. Uh, I use this kind of pizzicatos. Actually, you know them from Paganini, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> the left, left pizzicatos, it's, it's uh, very tricky, especially <laughs> if you have short fingers, it's very tricky. but. Um, but also in your cadenza, it's so interesting how there's passage work that's very fancy, lots of quick notes, but all of the sudden you put in as a tag, the three note motivic uh, theme, bam, bam, bam. <laughs> and you play, and I just love how you wove that together uh, in, in the solo, the sort of virtuoso passage work here comes the theme, and it, it's so meaningful. Whether you whether you give it in harmonics, as you do the first time I play that theme in violin harmonics, so high. I was just wondering, is that how high the the opera fiddle was? That that really. <laughs> <laughs> I just uh, wanted to show off uh, what you could do, and and because uh, uh, including the fast passages, they also follow the same material. They just did uh, the passage uh, as the texture. And uh, when we hear these three pictures, we feature the motific material more clearly. And, and also uh, when you have the left hand pizzicato, uh, also uh, when you stand up, the fingers stand up a little bit more and that would be helpful for your glissando. That is, a, yeah, this is a trick. <laughs> and when you stand up, your fingers would touch the string more. And that could be helpful uh, for your glissando. And also Paganini has used uh, like a five fingers, uh, like a four fingers. <laughs> this is a very uh, uh, much like an uh, imitation of a zhang player in, in Gu Zhang. Gu Zhang means the sita in Chinese instrument, plucking instrument. When you do the glissando, always uh, four pitches, and then the other, you bend up, some, something like that. I would use uh, the violin to imitate that kind of a gesture sometimes. And, and But you understood already, uh, you told me already <laughs> that you, you, you heard this uh, song. I, I really look forward to your performance. Oh, thank you. And Eric, I think you have some uh, sound clips from uh, Spring in Dresden, um, could we 
could we hear some of that music and our, our audience could hear what we're talking about a bit? Absolutely. Yeah, I wanted to just uh, also say that um, Danny is performing the solo part of Spring and Dresden with the New England Philharmonic um, on uh, May 1st in Boston. So please come um, to that if you're in town. Also want to invite you, if you're tuning in right now, that on YouTube, if you're watching there, you can type questions in the chat and we would love to get any questions that you have and and answer them here um, but in the meantime i'm going to play a little excerpt from the beginning and then an excerpt from the end of the piece and so if you can remember the uh the poem that uh we have and here i'll put it back up here oh, share my screen We have our happy ring comes in time when spring is in its prime. And then at the end, we have the town with all the blooming flowers. So here we have a recording. It's on the BMOP sound label with the Boston Modern Orchestra Project, the Mira Wong violin, Gilroy's conductor. Um, and so this is excerpt one from the very opening of the piece. <laughs> So beautiful, really evocative, and uh, love the shimmering sounds in the orchestra and the really intense violin in the upper range on lower strings gives that real vocal quality I think we were talking about earlier. Um, so and can I compare this, uh, to contrast this with the end of the piece, um, where we have here the, the final cadenza, um, which Danny will be playing, um, and uh, we're here it leads right into this incredibly thrilling, dramatic music. Um, um, it's interesting to, to think of all the flowers bu building up across town. There's, there's also, I feel, a kind of um, wild, uh, there's a dark um, brooding quality to it as well, but quite at the end you get this huge climax and then this section of stillness, and it's like this shimmering, shimmering life beginning, perhaps, at the end. Um, be curious to hear what the uh, listeners think. Um, so here is the end of the cadenza going through the end of the piece, it's about six minutes of music.
Beautiful. Beautiful. Bravo. What a great piece. Really love this one. Um, so what we thought we might do today is that since Dr. Chen, you've written three violin concerti um, to, to talk about them each, comparing them. And for, first, um, interested in what, what's drawn you to this medium. I, I know you're a violinist, perhaps um, that, that has something to do with it. But um, thinking about this piece in contrast to um, your other two, um, which will play Chinese folk dance suite and then Chinese rap, and just um, curious at, at, at how, how you think of these in comparison to one another. Oh, uh, I thought that this piece is more abstract. Uh, I, I didn't use a very obvious uh, Chinese uh, style of uh, melodic material. Except for, uh, you see, uh, when Danny uh, talks about the motific material, that is abstracted from the Chinese uh, folk music, which would have uh, this kind of uh, intervals. Um, but I didn't put it to the context of um, a folk song. Uh, you, you cannot hum along with uh, this tune. And, but the other two uh, is more like um, uh, a singable kind of uh, material. Although they are original works and not folk song arrangements, still you could feel more like a um, singable kind of uh, melodic uh, lines. For example, the first uh, uh, violin concerto, why I didn't start writing violin concerto until very late, because I didn't want my violin concerto to sound like a Tchaikovsky, <laughs> or sound like a Brock <laughs> Mendelssohn. <laughs> I, and I am afraid that when I start writing, uh, something would come up <laughs> in, in your mind and then I fail. So I, I don't uh, try to write violin concerto uh, until at the end of my residency of the Women's Philharmonic. And uh, our concert master, and also uh, uh, she is uh, Terry Bond, and also our cello, cello uh, principal, they invited me to write concerto for them. Mm. So, so before I left, I got to do it. <laughs> so uh, for the cello, I did a trio for her university. Uh, it's called New Pacific <laughs> Trio. And for our concert master, I wrote this first violin concerto for her. Uh, it, it was uh, awarded um, a Kutsawiski uh, Foundation, uh, the commissioning uh, um, award. And so and when I wrote this, uh, it came to my mind that three movements, each dedicated to different locations of folk music uh, in those styles. And so the first one is a kind of a minority, like that covers many provinces in the middle of China. Uh, so I took that as a lion dance, like, um, uh, um, like an energetic lion dance, as you can see from uh, many celebrations in Chinese New Year. And then the second movement, I, I have uh, this uh, lyrical uh, violin solo part when I ask the whole orchestra to recite the percussion sound. Uh, it's like a, a parade coming from far away. And when they dance, they would have uh, uh, little drums hung in, uh, on their wrist and then they would uh, beat and dance and, and like this in parade. So I use this scene to be coming from far away and uh, a little bit of uh, uh, approaching, approaching up to front. And the violin solo would represent the sweet tune like a song by a, um, a beautiful country girl. <laughs> so, so I would use this tune, uh, although it's in pentatonic style, uh, uh, but I didn't use one key, uh, they always uh, switch like a pentono or, or, or kind of uh, uh, moderations uh, so along with this uh, percussion sound. And I also adapted that movement for trio. And so I have uh, two percussionists and one in solo part. And also it was the last week in the Rivers School Conservatory okay. <laughs> by, by children, like uh, uh, she played the uh, one in solo part. And I, I thought that, uh, that one would be easier to get performances because a smaller ensemble, uh, which would have uh, two percussionists reciting the same as uh, the layers. 
And when the layers are not enough, we would also put on violin soloist to, to join in the reciting part as well when she doesn't play. Um, so that was the second movement. The third movement, I, I used um, uh, Yugo, you know, in the uh, West, Northwest of China, the Yugo uh, is a big minority, uh, which you would uh, uh, dance and sing by every person. Uh, I, I mean, this is a song and dance um, uh, 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 group of uh, people. And so I use a seven beat, like a seven, eight beat throughout the piece, um, the third movement, uh, like uh, two themes, uh, both are in that style from that location. Although uh, they are not real folk songs, I just uh, took that style to compose my own melodies. Uh, but that is, uh, I would say, straightforward, is uh, more obvious than my second violin concerto, which was uh, hidden. When when Danny would play this, uh, like a dee, 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 this is a fiddle <laughs> fingering, actually. But, but if I don't tell, uh, people wouldn't say that <laughs> because uh, they don't sound pentatonic. <laughs> it's uh, just a uh, hidden. Uh, and then my third violin concerto, you see, I wrote that for the celebration of uh, uh, Professor Kim, uh, who got her tenure from uh, uh, Kennesaw State University, where she taught, and the school commissioned me the piece to honor her and when she was uh, promoted to associate professor and tenure. Um, the school uh, love for her work, love for her students. They commissioned the piece for her to premiere. So it was also recorded by their uh, university orchestra. And that one I call Chinese rap <laughs> because uh, when we rap here, we have a more uh, 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 voice like uh, the words to tell stories. In, in Chinese rapping, it, it has uh, instruments to play in hand. Sometimes uh, you would um, play a set of uh, bamboos, like a pia pia pia, like a bang, pia pia, like this, to accompany the singing. Actually, uh, I thought the similarity. That's why the first time when I heard the rap, I smile because it sounds like the same for me, just the language is different. Uh, but the um, style and the, uh, what they're doing is the same. So, so I, I took the name Chinese rap and, and she did that so well. I didn't rehearse with her. When you heard that recording, it was her doing uh, immediately. I could feel that, oh, it's like speaking for me. <laughs> And so now you have for her all three of them. They are. That's fantastic. It's so interesting to, to hear of these different traditions, including some vocal traditions that have made their way into these works without voice. And but in the second movement of the second of the first concerto, you have the orchestra actually all vocalizing. You look at the score. I can pull up a, a, a slide of this. Hold on, one second. Oop, that's the wrong thing. <laughs> here, here we go. Uh, this you can see the uh, the violins is right at the very beginning, um, speaking, and the whole score looks like this, except for the viol the solo solo violin part, um, which we'll take a listen to this uh, in a second. I just was also thinking about your your spring in Dresden, which we listened to just before, and how. In that, you have a poem, but the poem is not sung. But I know that you have written that you actually did put in lines as if instruments were reciting the text word for word, but it's like a song without words hidden within there. So there's still this element of being hidden, abstracted, but then a violin on top, solo violin on top that's not necessarily saying the words, but emoting the character of it. Um, so um, let's take a listen to the second movement here from Young Ko, um, here uh, recorded by the Singapore Symphony with Cho Young Lin and Lan Shui.
That was so beautiful. I love that steady, steady rhythm in the orchestra, vocalizing it, and then the freedom of the violin, like a beautiful bird flying and singing. And I was just wondering, wow, so they are speaking throughout the whole movement. They're saying syllables, right? Yeah, and imitating percussion sound. Wonderful. And yeah, such that... great texture. It's kind of a canon when they overlap. You, you didn't hear each part clearly, uh, but the pulse is the same, uh, but different layers. Yeah, the the blast didn't play in this movement, they rest. <laughs> and I, I think um, um, and the percussion plays and the string plays. Uh, in the middle, you can hear a more obvious, the percussion comes in. Uh, and the string players would come in with uh, harmonics in the background. Otherwise, uh, I am uh, afraid that I would cover the solo part. <laughs> and so it's the harmonics. Yeah, it's a beautiful texture too of rethinking the roles of the players in the ensemble as well, um, doubling their, their role with vocalists and, and instrumentalists. Um, I thought let's listen to the first uh, opening bit uh, about the first four minutes of Chinese rap and then we can chat and get to some questions from this. So here is uh, the Kennesaw State University Symphony Orchestra with Helen Kim and Michael Alexander.
Very exciting. <laughs> then you could recognize my bowing. <laughs> yes, bowing and the slides and the, it's it's fantastic. Um, the harmonics make such a beautiful color when the strings have in the background and your percussion use is so colorful. Uh, even in Spring in Dresden as well. I mean, when in my life have I ever played in unison with a marimba? I mean, that's what I love about Spring in Dresden. I feel like I'm part of a, a, a big section. And in your Chinese rap uh, that we just heard, uh, the way you built it up into a big shape at the end was so exciting. Um, I'm sure when, when people hear it in concert, everyone jumps up and applauds. Also a big cadenza. <laughs> a big cadenza for one in solo. <laughs> <laughs> and because uh, I used to write uh, short cadenzas, um, my husband would bring on me, oh, you're not going to turn the piece in. <laughs> Your cadenza is not substantial enough. <laughs> so each time I would have to fix it. <laughs> this time I learned. <laughs> so both cadenzas have a big solo part. And even the first one, um, the third movement of the first violin concerto has a big fugue. A, a few of solo by the violin solo part. <laughs> and so, so I, I thought that that would be uh, very effective for, for soloists uh, to be featured. It, it's wonderful how you have your own distinctive uh, voice. And we also wondered, Eric and I, like you teach uh, young composers, how do you help them to find their voice? Ah, because of both for Ari and and I a uh, teacher in university, I, I think that uh, we have a lot to share. Uh, and usually uh, we would inspire them uh, and to let them talk first, to see what their uh, uh, cultural heritage is first. Um, if uh, they grow up before uh, rock and roll, for example, and I would ask them and line them up and how many schools, how many styles you have gone through, uh, which you like, and can you analyze uh, these kind of uh, characteristics? And can you uh, tell us the, uh, any special in this uh, school and in and their um, uh, uh, technique and, and the language? It is uh, helpful. Um, and some of my students who could have gone back to their um, uh, very original city, like um, uh, in Koto in Japan and to uh, bring back a lot of uh, folk instruments to show our whole class, right, in the seminar. And some of them would just uh, give a letter, like uh, uh, even in Singapore, you brought back uh, 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 different cultures. You, you have uh, Malay, you, you have Chinese, uh, right? Uh, you have uh, many kind of uh, uh, groups of uh, people who would feature. Uh, even they brought in uh, Indonesian, uh, Gamelan, or all this kind of uh, practice to introduce to classmates. I thought that that is uh, very important for us to share. And also they could dip into in their own uh, uh, study, because not until then 
uh, they don't find their own voice. Uh, after they uh, look at uh, different languages, like uh, musical languages, um, they would focus on what they love the most. And what, because of why they speak native language with their mother tongue, that would be the easier thing for them to learn differently, right? And, and, but sometimes it may not be the case because some Americans write Chinese music very really fantastic. <laughs> so depending on what you really love and really much deeply into it. And so one of my students who is American, um, and who used to play in the Irish pub every Thursday evening, uh, percussion. And he brought in a Mexican drumming uh, with a score, with layers of uh, scores uh, notated to show our class. I, I, I feel so excited because uh, I, I told him, can you analyze some for us? <laughs> and he now graduated already. So I just reminded my other students, go to look for those materials. <laughs> and that is very important for you because um, you show us something that excited you as a composer. And then you would get inspiration from those materials. Yeah, that is what I do <laughs> in the past 25 years. <laughs> That's really wonderful to hear. I think um, we do have a question in the chat from Megan Titzer, who's one of the NEP's violinists, asking you, what are you working on next? What's your next project? Uh -huh. <laughs> because uh, um, New Jersey Symphony asked me for a new piece. Uh, it's due next year, uh, mm -hmm. uh, 2023. And and not yet, <laughs> I can relax a little bit. Um, but usually I uh, got this uh, uh, um, commission always uh, two years ahead of time. So I would uh, uh, have uh, this idea in mind and I have to, when the time goes on, I collect ideas, uh, inspirations until I sit down to write. I, I just finished one string quartet for, um, the Rivers School Conservatory. That's why I went out uh, to see our um, uh, young students playing my works and they did a fantastic, uh, like a very excellent job. They have done uh, one in the string quartet. Uh, and also I, I, I wrote a solo uh, oboe piece for St. Paul Chamber Orchestra. Uh, uh, principal oboe list um, and, and already premiere. Um, and the other piece of Royal Academy in England to honor their anniversary. I think that they have a big, big anniversary to celebrate. So BBC and, and they broadcast all these solo pieces uh, for their musicians. Um, I, I write several uh, small ensemble pieces. <laughs> and like a, um, I still owe uh, a low bank. They asked for a piece I haven't written yet. <laughs> Usually when you ask me, that is a lot of pressure. <laughs> I, I should keep quiet. And, and then until I get the piece done, <laughs> that is uh, scary, right? Yeah. No, it's, yeah. It's Eric yeah. knows because Eric has an excellent premiere by the Boston Symphony with his concerto for orchestra. I love it. Um, uh, and yeah. the song and the score, everything fantastic uh, and very rich scoring uh, with this uh, big effect. Uh, I also think that the performance is excellent. Yeah, they did an amazing job. <laughs> well, yeah, thank you. No, we're really looking forward to hearing these new works um, and wish you the best and and for, for writing them. And it's, it's great to have such a range of writing, solo works, chamber works, orchestra works. It keeps it all interesting. I know, at least it does for me. <laughs> we look forward to seeing Dennis premiere because <laughs> that, that is an, a big theme. Uh, also a, a big event. Uh, you have uh, invited a uh, guest conductor, yeah? Yes, we do. Yeah, and, and we really look forward to it because a, a concert master, you know the orchestra really well. <laughs> and, and also I should say thank you for uh, Eric because uh, 
when he wrote me an email, I was so happy. I said, oh, the piece will be performed live <laughs> because of、uh, um, two years, we have、uh, many things to stop.、Uh, although my school already reopened with、uh, all these big orchestra bands, pieces, or、uh, or on stage, and still not everything resume. We even have、uh, an opera produced. Cozy by Mosa already last week a post post on、uh, our school stage with free performances. I think that they did fantastic job. Um, we really look forward to your great concert. Thank you. Yeah, we are as well, and、uh, also in in thinking about your role as a teacher as well. Um, the twenty twenty call for scores winner of the New England Philharmonic. Was、uh, Sophia Rocha, who's one of your students, and we were really happy that we were able to work out the programming so you could both be on the same concert. So we very much looking forward to hearing both of those pieces.、Too. We are so grateful to you. Oh my God! <laughs> When Sophia wrote us, all of us jumping up. <laughs> we are so happy for her, and thank you, Eri, because she is always the most productive. She would bring in many, many pages every week, <laughs> and and she also plays the trombone. You have to know. Yeah.、Um, yeah. Her thesis,、uh, master degree, is、um, viola concerto. Beautiful viola concerto. Next time you get to see that too. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. She is so prolific. So you took her her piece as a winning orchestra piece, and then next you would look at her. Oh, we all like concerto. <laughs>、uh, it's a beautiful piece, and, and and we love it. And and now I guess she、uh, is in a residency、uh, for a composer's colony in Nebraska, Lincoln, Nebraska.、Yeah. Well, we can't wait to hear the viola concerto, and hopefully, continue more of her works and your work. And we、well. thank you a thousand times. Oh, well, <laughs> you just pick great music, so we 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 can't wait to hear it. Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for joining us and joining Chen Yi here. And we are.、Um, you can tune in in May to hear Igor Santos speak about his work. And、um, hear about the the final concert of the season. So thank you, Dr. Chen. It's so great to have you here. Thank you, Dr. Chen. It's a delight to meet you. Ah, and thank you, Danny. Thank you, Eric. And also thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> Behind the scenes, keeping us all running. Yeah. Yeah.、Uh, and we look forward to your great concert. Thank, thank you. you. Take care.